Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Media Watch. I'm your host, Dr. Savvy. And with me, I've got my, one of my best friends. How many best friends can you have, actually? Uh, we haven't been on a show together for ages, but I've uh, managed to convince him to come on. Uh, it is the wonderful Gurpreet Singh. It's good to be back, Savvy. Yes, no more Star Trek jokes. Oh, we'll have to spit one or two in at least. Absolutely. Um, just a little bit of background about Gurpreet. Uh, Gurpreet actually does a number of roles. Uh, I'm sure he won't mind me saying that you did train as a lawyer. Uh, and he currently is working at the Shepherd's Bush uh, Gurdwara, which is, uh, I think, a trustee or something, aren't you? Yes, I'm one of the managing trustees at the Central Gurdwara Khalsa Jatha, uh, oldest Gurdwara in the West, established 1908. And the other thing that he does uh, as another role is uh, he also uh, is involved in, I think, IT management consultancy, that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, I work in uh, telecommunications, dealing with uh, large-scale global projects. So that's what keeps me busy during the day. So we'll be able to get your expertise later on, hopefully, on the uh, iPhone 6 and iPhone <laughs> Plus and the Apple Watch or whatever it is, you know. Uh, I always see this program as an outreach for us to talk about the media, to understand what's actually happening in the world, to be educating and to get views. We are commentators uh, in terms of actually understanding uh, what is happening and really getting a perspective uh, of uh, how humanity is actually developing and in some cases, sadly, not developing, especially if they're going to start a war between each other. So let's move on to the first part of the show where we look at major headlines. There's a couple this week. We're going to show you a bit of footage uh, with regards to the massive flooding that's taking place in Kashmir. There's been deaths, uh, really terrible situation there. Uh, I think I saw down here, um, and there's a picture that we've got also of uh, uh, Modi uh, in his plane uh, surveying uh, the, the terrible situation out there. He's doing an aerial survey in that particular photograph. Uh, I think that particular photograph came from the India government press. Now, there's lots of people who are helping out. This is apparently the worst flooding that's taken place for over 50 years. Um, and I think that there are many uh, Sikh uh, I say charities uh, that are getting involved to try and help out uh, those particular communities that are actually affected. And as you see from the video, uh, it's a terrible situation in terms of uh, schools and uh, the main city. I've actually been there many, many years ago when I was about 16 years old. It's the most beautiful part of the world called uh, Shirinagar uh, over in um, Jammu and Kashmir. And they've had a lot of trouble. I think, interesting, we were talking earlier on about when there is you know, mm. such a terrible situation and it has a history of communal violence as well. Um, communities really yeah they do come together I mean uh, disaster doesn't decide whether it's going to uh, affect one race or another it affects everyone together and what we have seen here is a very rapid response one by the Indian government but also by the aid agencies uh, one good thing is a number of the Sikh organizations which are UK based have actually jumped into action we've seen United Sikhs on the ground Carl Saeed are doing a fantastic job on the ground, uh, you know. And we've also got all the other uh, 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 Sikh charities also helping, including the Sikh channel. So it is good to see the Sikh groups moving in to help. And let's hope that something positive can be taken away from this adversity, that Hindus, Sikhs, Muslims, Christians coming together to help each other rather than a seeing turmoil that we always seem to hear from that region. Absolutely. Um, I think um, in that whole um, uh, Himalayan region, uh, there was devastation everywhere, isn't there? So yes, it's actually even the floods are uh, even down in Rajasthan. I was, uh, a friend of mine has just got there and he sent me some video on WhatsApp and uh, I was just surprised to see it. It's you very shocking. Yeah, you yeah. expect deserts and yet you see raging torrents. Absolutely. So the other headline that we wanted to cover off, and uh, this time next week when we do the show, uh, we tend to show, record the show towards the end of the week. Um, I believe that next Friday um, we should know whether or not Scotland decides to go independent or whether it decides to stay in the Union, as it's described. I wanted to ask you about it because I think there's a lot of interesting areas that uh, come up and about, don't they? For example, uh, finance, uh, and even things like, for example, currency, or, or the way that banks are, are well, actually it's, suggesting... It's like any really divorce. Divorce is complex. I'd say avoid it. Uh, if you're going to try and split Scotland away, you know, you do have the issues. Is uh, At the moment, we have um, the SNP saying, hey, they want to keep the Queen. They want to keep the pound. 
They want to keep British military. Well, why can't they keep Cameron and uh, Ed Miliband and uh, Clegg also? <laughs> why, why, why step away if you're keeping I think so you many look things? At the, um, the argument behind mm. the independence, um, uh, you know, situation, what, what's actually being argued mm. for. They already in Scotland, and you have to put forward a balanced view on this because obviously, yes. you know, people have to make up their own minds regardless of our views. But if you, if, you, if you place the argument on the table with regards to independence, there is a situation with regards to, um, first of all, uh, you have um, the oil. Now, is it going to run out in 25 years' time or is it going to run out in, you know, 150 years' time? Irrelevant, because ultimately that brings in revenue. And if you look at education, you know, in Scotland, kids are really fortunate they don't have to pay that massive hike or something like £9,000 just to actually go to university. So education should be free, and it should be free for everyone. Well, that money is coming from somewhere, so it would still be coming through someone's taxation. Universities don't run for free, so it could be a very rude awakening for the Scottish people when they discover that, having gone it alone, that their economy is not able to sustain some of the services that they uh, enjoy today. Well, they might also argue that, uh, and I'm not kind of saying either way, but one could also argue that there's better management, better ownership, uh, better determination, because that's what it is, it's self-determination, but de better determination of what you do with the finances and how they're controlled. Isn't it a little bit too much, too late, with regards to concessions, saying we'll do this special act for you? Why was that not thought of? ages and ages ago, why was it, well, why is it now suddenly well, people are things out of the, the woodwork to say, well, we'll give you this extra, <laughs> extra bit of, uh, you know, autonomy. Scotland has devolution and uh, they do have certain uh, powers. They do have their own uh, Scottish Parliament and uh, the same for Wales, but they want total independence. And it's... Yes, the concessions are there. No one wants to see the union break up. Uh, it's quite clear from the markets that uh, uh, the financial markets don't want to see the union break up. In fact, yesterday uh, when the Dow ended down, uh, one of the reasons cited was Scotland. Which, but then again, you see, that's a US say market. Scaremongering, possibly. Right? But we'll, we'll see what happens. But you know, we'll leave it up to the voters to decide it, the information presented to them uh, and how they experience that. We don't live in Scotland. Um, but we are part of the union in terms of being in, in England. And if you're watching this internationally, I'm sure you'll be interested in the actual outcome when it comes about. Um, I know a lot of tourists that come to uh, England, I would say, normally go off to Scotland as well as part of their holidays. And, uh, you know, both countries are beautiful in their own way. Well, they might need to get two visas. They might then. need two visas. They're <laughs> the Shergan visa actually will apply. I don't know. Right, okay, let's move on to the next part of the program where we actually look at a number of headlines. The first one I'd like to look at, and uh, interestingly, this is the week of the... Um, the sad situation of September 11, 2001. Um, I thought it was quite sad that we're still talking about terrorism and managing what is now called ISIS, also known as uh, IS, um, Islamic State. It is now the term that they tend to be using at the moment for that. I see that the, the Guardian today, meaning uh, Friday, says that uh, the Syrian government and its close allies in Moscow uh, and Tehran warned Barack Obama that any offensive against Islamic State within Syria would violate international law. So you're kind of like damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, right? Obama has to make a decision. It has to be a leadership situation where, you know, in the past he said that clearly uh, there isn't necessarily clear leadership on what to do. But right now, you know, they're facing the situation of actually arming uh, certain groups. Now, would they be going against the Assad government as well? So, you know, and who's actually siding those parts as well when you look at it from a United Nations perspective? It's a continuous melting pot. You arm one group, uh, one day you're, they're your friend, next day they're not. So it is not an easy situation. However, it's not a situation I believe that the world should leave alone, uh, nor is it a new situation. I, I wouldn't put this down to just being from the time of September the 11th. Uh, it's, it's one which has been going on for many hundreds of years. Well, let's look at the uh, reason Sikh why. history is written in this level of intolerance. When Guru Nanak, uh, uh, there's a lot of Bani written about the barbarity of the Barbara's regime and how many people were being killed and that's still going on and it's the same ideology behind it, yet people very rarely discuss that ideology. Do you think that things like, um, unfortunately we did um, uh, talk about a beheading that took place and then another one took place as well with another journalist, this kind of barbaric activity, you call it, right? 
this is kind of further aggravating the whole situation. People are saying they really need to do something about it. If you look at uh, Obama on, uh, this week on Wednesday night during his part of his speech said, so tonight with a new Iraq government in place and following consultations with allies and Congress at home, I can announce that the America will lead a broad coalition to roll back the terrorist threat. Obama said, our objective is clear. We will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIS through a comprehensive and sustained counterterrorism strategy. So the, this whole theme of terrorism itself, right? I mean, then where does that lead to? Because ultimately, if you look at the Mujahideen, for example, they morphed into something that was actually fighting against uh, America in the end, which was you know, way before 2001. So when you start arming certain groups, you know, should, it, should there not be a force that goes in directly to sort it out? It's not just a question of arming groups. It's a massive global ideology. People talk about terrorism coming back to the West. It's not coming back. It's actually here. We're exporting it to Syria and Iraq, and it is already here. This is, there's a lot of homegrown fanaticism going on. And until the government starts to look into that and people, society as a whole, starts to deal with it, it will always go on. I see I've got, just been handed a news headline here, actually. Um, so let me pass that on to you. Something about Afghans. So hot off the press. So police today smashed an Afghan uh, gang suspected of making one million a year by selling smartphones stolen from London commuters. So we see that, that making money through different routes to try and push it in through different ways. So, uh, you know, a, a country that's trying to help another country and that they've got crooks in that country as well, haven't they? Well, you get crooks wherever you go. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so let's just talk about this uh, just a little bit more because I'm, I'm a bit worried about the whole arming, like I said before, the whole arming mm. situation here. That if you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Right? But you've got to actually nail your kind of thoughts on a mast eventually and go forward in a righteous manner. But also, should we not all look at the fact that in uh, Saudi Arabia, as far as we know, right, there are certain groups, certain very rich individuals that are funding this whole kind of war situation, that whole kind of wasabi type strategy that they're yes. at, which is a jihadist Maybe type. early on, ISIS now are pretty much well funded themselves by having looted banks and uh, they've actually and now got oil like under their yeah. control. So uh, it, that is an issue that funding does go on. It's the funding of the ideology in schools they found here, some wasabi influenced, uh, sorry, not wasabi, uh, wa Wahibi, Wahibi. Wahibi. Wahibi yeah, influenced yeah. Yeah. Um, textbooks, and that spreads hatred. You have children coming out who believe, I am right to hate that person because that person doesn't belong to my group. Mm. And that sort of hatred is what needs to be tackled. I, I think you and find that, that in some other ground. religions as well, though, don't you? You find that in sometimes there is a, almost like a, a, there's a Christian, that some Christians will say evangelist-wise that if you don't believe in Christianity, then you don't believe in uh, the right religion. I think Sikhi is quite interesting but, because we don't actually go to mi do any missionary work. Well, and, Sikh is, uh, we, us Sikhs, we don't believe we have a franchise on God. We believe God has uh, created everything and everything is part of God. However, maybe we should be looking at this, the answer to the question, should Obama go in and do something as a Khalsa? If we as Khalsa were there, would we act or would we sit by silently and watch such devastation? Absolutely. We would act. We would act. Now, um, some more aspects of what's happened in the news, um, and this was about a couple of weeks because we had a, a week off uh, for the show. We uh, saw that in the news there was a lot of coverage. Now, there is a statement that people are using at the moment called Islamophobia. This is, unfortunately, this is the thing that's running through the current media at the, at the moment. The BBC, for example, showed uh, a program on the sad situation in Rochdale where I find it out unbelievable that 1,500 kids have been abused, but only five people have been arrested. Mm. And there's been this massive cover-up. Is it because they were trying to protect their votes? Or is it because uh, the council in particular uh, didn't have a, a, a decent policy on, on managing this? Or were they afraid about upsetting a certain community? But again, in the same week on the BBC, they showed uh, a program uh, based in Pakistan where they were saying there was a similar problem there. So do we see there being a, a cultural problem or is it pointing towards uh, again this Islamophobia or is it the fact that there is and we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago on the phone we were talking about 
moral con conduct. It doesn't matter where you come from, mm. but the moral conduct of individuals and the moral uh, aspect of communicating what is right by a religious group. For example, if you've got an imam in a mosque, where is that moral statement to say this is unacceptable in that society? Well, I can't comment on an, uh, on an imam. I'm not a Muslim. But morality is quite often derived from religion. Most laws that you get in countries are derived from religion. And that's where we get our morality quite often. Now, what you're seeing is there's a massive failure. For example, what's been happening in Pakistan, uh, you've had the police turning a blind eye. And very few sort of NGOs trying to help out in the situation. But it's been basically turned a blind eye. And the same thing that's happened in the UK. And we need to ask ourselves, why are people turning a blind eye? Is it a big liberal conspiracy? Well, hang on. We set ourselves boundaries that to deal with the problem, you can't look at this element of it, you can't look at this element, and you can't look at that element, because liberally it would not suit us to identify that it's a cultural issue there, because we're identifying a group of people, or it's that. So instead, what you have is this mass label. It became acceptable to call it an Asian problem, but it wasn't an Asian problem. And until the government and the media start to identify that, hey, over 90% of the perpetrators were Muslim. What's going on or, here? Or maybe they weren't Muslim, but they were from a Pakistani background or something. Or maybe they well, had that they were, kind of... They were, they, those stats were there. They were taken. Now, okay, so so isn't, doesn't it worry you right now that we have 1,500 kids that were abused, right? Five people have been... Yeah, but then where are the perpetrators? 1,500 that have made it through into the statistics. And in one town, Rotherham, a t not a massive place. Think of all the other places where this is going on. Exactly. There are places where people will not use taxis because they're fit scared of getting raped. Mm. And this is a huge problem, yet it's been swept but under the carpet. But how do we resolve this? How do we, how do we, say, we, need, do we say to victims that you need to come out and actually point these people out so well, that they, we can bring they, them to they, justice? They've got to be brave They to do have that, been, right? but have yeah. the police been doing anything about yeah. it? This, it needs a whole-scale review of the police, and the politicians, the councils, the officials, the social services, because all our agencies have failed. If in modern Britain, 1,500 young girls, underage girls, were sexually abused not once, not twice, not thrice, Repeatedly. 10, 20, 30, 40 times. Imagine if that's our daughter and that happened. How would you feel about it? And it's not happening with just one child, thousands. Mm. And in just in one place, and yet, there should be a huge uproar. Mm. There should be rioting on the streets. I'm not that I'm saying there should be rioting on the streets. No, that's what, they're, they're, a wrong phrase. You should see people protesting on protesting, the streets. Saying that they need to do and, something about it. Uh, that, and where is it? It's all been swept away. Mm. Well, we haven't heard much from it in the last couple of weeks because there are other. They, they, yeah. I, I would have thought you would see, you know, ministers resigning mm. in a, in a modern day Britain we have had underage girls being abused. It doesn't even matter if they're underage. Anyone should not be sexually abused. Absolutely. It's wrong. Yeah. And we, our society is failing. OK. So I mean, uh, lots of news coverage so far on that. And we'll see how that story develops as well going forward. Let's talk about something that, is quite, that you're quite passionate about. I handed you a mobile phone before. It wasn't your phone, was it? <laughs> no. No, it's somebody else's well, Actually, I happen yeah. to have the same handset. Right. OK. So you, know, you were telling me that you moved different handsets. We're going to show you a video. I thought it was quite a nice video, though, the way they pitched it. And this is the video that Apple, within a couple of days ago, actually uh, used to launch their uh, Apple Watch.
So if you do want to contact us, you can do that by sending us an email at info at seekchannel.tv or uh, you can follow us through the hashtag, which is uh, hashtag Media Watch. Uh, now, your opinion, because you, you, know, you know all the technologies because you've used all these, what is this, an Android or something? Or, uh, that's an Android, and, that's and an that's HTC. A, that's so a Windows phone and then... You've no. got, here you uh, go. Actually, these are, these are, these are, so be very fair yeah, these these are the same models, these are ones. They? Yeah, so these are both HTCs, okay. the latest M8. And, uh, you, so where's your little watch thing? You know? Rolex only, mate. So tell us, what um, is the iPhone uh, with the combination of the watch? Is it something that's a, a major innovation? It, you know, the way they pitch that thing, it looks so beautiful, doesn't it? All the different options you can have, all the different things that you can do. But this technology has been around for a while, right? The technology has been uh, there for a while. You've seen all these, uh, the Nike fuel and yep. all, all these fuel. various. Sorry, my Nike yeah. fuel, yeah. <laughs> You've got one there too, yeah. So the technology is there. You know, we've been, uh, it's, it's slowly moving from being to something that you carry to things that you wear. I mean, we've always worn technology. A watch is technology. Uh, it's had design. It's had thought. Uh, it is a technological piece. Mm. But we're starting to think about, um, you know, what, how does how do I how does that technology fit into our life? How does it help us? So, I mean, yes, what Apple is doing with the iPhone and with the iWatch is interesting. It's nothing new. It's already there. Uh, other providers are doing it. It's something Android is a bit more ahead on, but I'm sure Apple might give it a better design. So they, edge. you think they give it a bit of a push in terms of the industry? They feel like because so that some, because they had so many uh, thousands of applications out before that you know it's easily adaptable because those app and it's harder to get an application on the Apple platform than it is compared mm, to the Android platform. No, I'll tell you what gives it a push. Name another brand that has its launch covered by the news. Right, okay. Can, can you name another right. brand? So Just offhand. There's a lot of, lot of media attention to it. Yeah? You, but you hear about Apple's yeah. launches. It gets a lot of media attention, and people go for it, and then they try it out. Okay, hey, this is good. I might like this. Right. And because of that, it gets a push. That it you may think maybe they sit back intentionally, and they say, oh, look, um, Samsung's done one, Sony's done one, Nike's got fuel band. You know, um, they, they sit back and they watch. Is it? Somebody once said to me, the difference between creativity and innovation is that creativity is when you create a, a brand new idea, something that no one's actually thought of before, whereas innovation is to take that idea and, and just kind useful. of uh, adapt it and kind of mold it and bring it. So it's not your idea, it's somebody else's idea, but you just kind of do it better. MP3 player, for example, there was the Rio, there was mm -hmm. loads of devices before the iPod, but yeah. they were revolutionary because, and kind of pardon the pun, with the little circle yeah. that they had to, to control use. the navigation and the user experience is really good. So, so maybe, maybe they do that and maybe make it easier for product, you know? They do. That's what you get. So Apple maybe has a mass market appeal, but they're two years behind the curve. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll see what happens with that. Um, well, that's uh, the part of the program that's finished there. We've got one more part of the program to do, uh, and that is that we talk about Seek issues. Now, there's a video, another video that we're going to show you. Uh, this is called the uh, Play Foul on FIFA. Sing. I was nominated by Goldman Sachs to call foul on FIBA. I am a sick. I should be able to wear a turban while playing basketball. I now nominate Himmat Singh, Saroop Gar, Amit Gar, Shish Paul Singh, and Tharoop Gar. a cute kid there that you saw in the video. FIBA is the authority in the US that recently made a statement about banning Sikhs from playing basketball uh, and one of the great initiatives that started similar to the ice bucket challenge that we saw earlier on is that you challenge three other people to score a basket. Uh, you talk about the fact that FIFA should really be allowing people to wear uh, bugs or uh, butkas uh, headgear when they're actually playing basketball because uh, it's very unfair and there's some talent. If you look at some of the videos on YouTube, there's some incredible basket players that are Sikh guys I don't think even I could, uh, I can probably need about, you know, a meter before I put it in the basket. But these guys are like doing it from like, you know, 15, 20 
40, 50 feet away, they're scoring baskets. So it's an incredible talent that uh, uh, FIBA is actually missing out on. That's one thing. Why are we having this time and time again? We saw in Canada last year, uh, there was a, uh, a particular ban that they were trying to force on kids wearing potkars and playing football, right, in school, soccer, we should say, right? Are we being picked on as Sikhs or what? I think it's partly that and also partly that a lot of these sports federations are very slow to adapt, very slow to realize the world around them. But we've been playing cricket. You know, you saw, uh, you know, Milka Singh, you know, at the, Olymp at the uh, Olympic Games and the Commonwealth Games. Do you think that part of uh, people not knowing who Sikhs are, well, um, we, that they actually say, well, actually, you're all brown, you all wear turbans, you all kind of possibly come from the East, therefore we're going to discriminate against you because it's one way of actually getting back at you. In, Whereas when you think about it, Sikhs have been living in the, in the West for years and years. The discrimination is there. In fact, Sikhs are the litmus test as to whether there is true freedom in the world. If we can do something or survive somewhere, the chances are you'll find freedom there. Uh, the, what you find is even probably with the Olympics, I can't say for sure, I've not looked into it precisely, but I'm sure some Sikhs would have had to argue their way through. When uh, Sant Deja Singh attended uh, Cambridge University, he was being refused because he was a Sikh. And he actually went and argued his point and then got his admission. Uh, so we find ourselves having to go through that battle. But once we're being gone through it, you'll find that a lot of those uh, agencies or federations or bodies, they become a lot more acceptable and adaptable in dealing with other faiths. That's good. Well, um, I'm afraid we come to the end of the show, really. Kind of time has whizzed by really quickly. <laughs> uh, so wonderful to have you uh, back on the show again. Yeah. It's really brilliant to spend some time with you and uh, always well-informed about uh, what's going on, passionate about uh, the news as well as passionate about uh, looking after um, Shepherds Bush Gurdwara as well as <laughs> the, other, the other things that you do as well. Uh, so we've kind of covered a whole range of issues today. Uh, we've looked at feet, uh, we've looked at sad situations over in uh, Rochdale. We've looked at the Apple Watch. Mm. You remain to be convinced on that one. No, uh, I, uh, if we had timed our program with that watch, the battery may have run out and we'd still be talking. Yeah. Or how about if you, uh, this would be quite bad, because ba if the battery life was really bad, yeah. right, and you'd go to uh, someone's house at a function mm. and it would be past midnight, and because the battery, in theory, you know, should last longer, if it didn't last more than 24 hours, you wouldn't know when to go home, would you? Yeah, you wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. God forbid they had a clock on their wall. Absolutely. God forbid you're looking at your watch while you're in someone's yeah, house having yeah, a good time with them. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so also uh, we were looking at the sad situation in Kashmir, and we did discuss um, this continuing problem that we have in the world uh, with you know communities fighting each other and the ISIS uh, uh, kind of threat that sits out there and the fact that we really need to work together to resolve that. So... Until next time, thanks a lot for joining us, and uh, thanks very much, Kupri, for Thank joining you. us as well. All right, good to go, Carlton. Bye, good to keep up.